Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode one of the Lives of Adventure podcast, and I am your host, Jeff Gardner. Obviously, since this is the first episode, it is a bit of an experiment, but I won't uh, feign to ask for your forgiveness or your pity. If you have any feedback, if you love the episode, if you hate it, please let me know. I really like feedback, and I certainly don't want to continue with this if everybody thinks it's crap. So, in this podcast, we will aim to bring you the stories of people that live lives that are a little less common. But we won't just be talking to adrenaline junkies or those that are living on the fringes of society. To me, adventure is a lot more than just risking your life. To me, it's all about actively putting yourself into a position where the outcome is actually completely uncertain. You really don't know how it's going to end. So in this podcast, we'll be exploring adventure in many different forms. We'll obviously be talking to climbing bums and sailors that prefer to cross oceans alone and other so-called adventure sport devotees. But we'll also be talking to entrepreneurs who build businesses, people that quit their corporate jobs to pursue their passions, and those that just enjoy getting lost in their own backyards. So without further ado, let's get right into it. This week, we are talking to none other than my little brother, John Gardner, who at this stage might be better known on the interwebs as Common Jack. And since I introduce him uh, in the actual episode a few minutes in, I'm just going to go ahead and cut right to the chase. So I hope you enjoy this, the very first episode of the Lives of Adventure podcast. Let's start this out, and I'd love to hear about your first memory of music. That's a great question. Uh... I don't know if this is in the timeline of my life, my first memory of music, but the strongest memory of of music from my youth uh, is the early morning car rides to Snowshoe after Christmas um, when we would pile in the car at like 5 a.m. or whatever and, and, and head, to, head to the mountains in West Virginia to go skiing all day. And I would always remember like falling asleep right when we took off and waking up a couple hours later in in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia in the mountains. And dad of course was playing like almond brothers or, you know, any of those kinds of bands, grateful dead. Um, and I think it, it, there's something about that landscape in West Virginia and the, the kind of occasion of it all that, um, that music was (laughs) kind of perfect for, um, so I, I remember learning all of all of those songs and all of those bands stuff in the car. Nice. The way to snowshoe. Nice. Uh, the yeah. Almond Brothers definitely holds a very special place in my heart. Oh, totally. Uh, I mean, obviously, they're fucking good, but like... Uh, right. Yeah, there was also a lot of emotional baggage attached there. Right, right, right. Yeah, same for me. So what's the first song you ever learned to play on an instrument? It smells like Teen Spirit what really yeah yeah oh come on it's so easy it's so it's such an easy song it's perfect for for especially because i didn't play acoustic guitar my the first guitar that i played was that that strat handed me down oh, man that uh, is, that's really disappointing yeah i'm sorry i'm what? really disappointed about that answer how how i don't, I don't know man like you're like so talented <laughs> now and you can like play all these instruments and fucking smells like teen spirit power chord world that's it i mean it? that's that's where it, all of my friends started. That's where all uh, of us started. Yeah, it fair. was Power Chord Land. And then from there, I think the first song that I learned on the acoustic was Blackbird. And then the second song, funny enough, I know for a fact, was Falling Slowly. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how far in advance of Once was Falling Slowly when you learned that? Uh, I must have been... It was shortly after the movie came out, so... I was 15. So what that puts it eight years in advance. Yeah. A long time. In yeah. Advance. Something like that. Long time. Very yeah. interesting. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, I should probably introduce you, uh, since all, right. <laughs> all the listeners of this podcast, this future <laughs> podcast won't know who you are. Um, right, right. today we're talking with, uh, common Jack, AKA my little brother, John Gardner. <laughs> 
This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so much fun. Uh, and, you know, I think in terms of adventure, like like I was saying uh, a moment ago, uh, we were talking about a moment ago, adventure takes a lot of different forms. And I think you've taken a very uh, non-normal path, uh, certainly since high school, but probably uh, during high school as well. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, when I look back at you know, how I went through high school and how you went through high school, there's a lot to, there's a lot that I kind of envy about, you know, how open you were to the whole thing and how much you were kind of like, ah, sure, whatever, fuck it. Uh, I'll be friends with whoever yeah. I want and fuck the rest of these people that were haters, like, don't care. Um, yeah, you know, like legitimately, I think that's a pretty cool way to go through, uh, through that phase of life. Uh, and you seem to pull it off pretty well. I mean, anybody that does like theater while in high school generally has to probably have that sort of attitude, right? Yeah, I, I, I guess. Um, it certainly, in my memory, didn't feel like that at the time. <laughs> but if that if that is the takeaway that you and the rest of the family has, has uh, I guess, taken away, then sweet. That's awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, because I was, for a couple of years of high school, I was straddling a couple of weird uh, worlds. I mean, I was a, a runner for the first half of high school. And then I kind of started doing musicals and plays and stuff while I was still kind of part of that athlete crew, uh, which, as you can maybe imagine, uh, created some interesting situations. Uh, and there was certainly a, a bit of a fallout with with my running buddies when I kind of was like, hey, I'm quitting in the middle of junior year. I just kind of – especially because middle of junior year when I did quit. Uh, the teams, especially our track team, had just won a state title. So I kind of like, and to be very honest, I wasn't a huge contributing member of that win, but I still was part of the community. So I think there was a bit of a, a fallout that was not the easiest to handle at the time. But again, like doing theater in high school, uh, you know, that stereotypically is a, is one of the most close knit kind of niches or cliques of high school people, you know? So that I, band, right? Yeah. That <laughs> yeah, band, band choir, all of it. Right. Um, yeah. But so I, I was, I was lucky in, in that. I think my friends who did that and also I'm sure that my teachers who, who were teaching me at the time, um, they probably heard through the grapevine about things and, uh, they all, well, welcomed me with open arms. Cool. So here's yeah. an interesting one: uh, running and then music. Uh, our dad was a runner. Our mom is very into music. Do yeah. you feel like uh, there was? Did you ever feel like there was a lot of pressure to do either of them? No, actually. Uh, and both mom and dad, uh, after the fact, kind of were were telling me that they were hoping that I wouldn't go either way. Uh, like when I told dad that I was going to sign up for cross country when I was in sixth grade, he told me a couple of years after that, that he thought I would last two weeks, which I was like, thanks for that's the face, vicious, <laughs> like brutal. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then when I started doing shows in high school, um, I think mom was, you know, all for it. Cause it was, it was something for me to do after school and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was, end of my sophomore year, beginning of junior year, when I told her that I was thinking about going to college for it and, you know, kind of subsequently pursuing it professionally, <laughs> that she actually like had a really serious talk with me one day after school. I was like at home in the basement playing video games or something. And she came down and forced me to pause it. And she was like, I just want you to know, I know from personal experience, if you're going to do this, you're going to run into a lot of really messed up stuff and a lot of really messed up people. <laughs> And at the time I was like, whatever, mom, like it's fine. Like I don't really care. Um, but I, you know, and now having done this professionally for, oh God, three or four years. Um, having seen a lot of messed up stuff and met a lot of messed up people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, seriously though, I'm kind of going, oh man, she, she really hit the nail on the head. Ah, um, that parental wisdom that we never want to understand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So there wasn't any, you know, like you never felt any, you know, I don't know, the motivation to get into any of those things wasn't uh, driven by oh, our parents at all. Yeah, the original question. Yeah, uh, no, actually, I, I, I didn't really feel that at all. Um, 
mom and dad, I, I think, were very adamant in kind of letting all of us, I think, kind of do what we felt at the time, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't know what your experience was like in, in high school and early college, but they kind of always, um, yeah, they were kind of like, well, if that's what you want to do. Go well, they let me go to Berkeley College of Music for a semester. They did so let you do I that. I suppose they pretty much let me do whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. So, you know, you finished, uh, you know, you finished your high school career with uh, a couple of amazing standout performances, uh, Lumiere to be very specific. And uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 we're, we're going to bring that into this. Yeah, we're um, going to bring that up, of course. I know. In fairness, that was really good. I remember that. It was like really impressive. I remember seeing that and going, wow, huh, he's not shit. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he doesn't suck. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and honestly, I think actually that may have been the very first performance that Gina saw you in. Um, oh God, I know it was. It totally yeah, was. Yeah. Um, so I think I remember her saying a similar thing, like not long after that being like, yeah, I was kind of going in going like, all right, going to see Jeff's little brother do a show in high school. It's going to be crap. And then seeing the show and being like, oh, OK, cool. It wasn't totally was not crap. Pain- right. <laughs> not, not totally painful. Right, right. As painless as a high school musical can be. Yeah, exactly. So, like, tell me a little bit more about um, about that decision process and that thought process of, uh, yeah, I want to go to do musical theater in university. And, yes, I'm going to go, you know, to this school uh, that's got a great program that's going to, you know, it's going to be far away. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be a, you know, sizable investment of everything, time, money, anything else you want to slice it by. What, what was kind of the thinking there? Like, did you know at that point that like, yes, this is what I'm going to do for my career. And I just, I have to do whatever I need to do now to get into the position where, you know, it can work out. Uh, yeah. So the whole, that whole decision, um, kind of came from my experience experience going to so after um after my junior year of high school i went to a uh, summer arts camp called interlochen which is in the state of michigan here in the states and um and it was you know it was exactly what it sounds like you know i went for six weeks to take acting classes and voice lessons and all sorts of audition techniques classes and all things like that and and also do a show um and interlochen is uh It has a reputation as being uh, not only one of the oldest arts camps in the country, but also one of the best, bar none. Um, Their orchestra camp, you know, pulls in students from all over the world. I think of the 30 of us who went for the musical theater program, I remember hearing they had like 1,200 applicants for that summer that I went. Um, So it's it's not just like, you know, six-week farting around for the summer and you know it's not to, band camp in other words it's not band camp no <laughs> it's not um so it, you know i was that was the first time that i was really surrounded every single person my age that i was surrounded by was somebody who was not only very very good at what they what they were there for but also very serious about pursuing it professionally um you know a lot of these kids had been performing since they were like four or five years old like some of them had been on broadway already like things like that and i was over here like oh i've done three musicals like what is this whole thing about um so that was a really interesting experience and really eye-opening of of kind of the the possibilities and and um the the kinds of people that populate my industry for the most part which was really, really amazing. And another thing that that camp does at the very end is they have a college fair where a bunch of universities from from all over the country come and kind of set up a little booth and they have one day where you can kind of go and talk to as many of them as you want. Um, And that was kind of where it was made clear uh, the kind of, uh, I don't sacrifices is not really the right right term, I don't think, but the the kind of commitment that it would take to kind of do it professionally. And, you know, I was 17 and so caught up in how fun everything was. Uh, it just made sense at that moment when I got back from Interlock and that I would go do all these auditions for colleges and, uh, you know, pick the best one that accepted me. Cool. To go study. Yeah. Cool. How do you think you got in to Interlock and if they only accepted 30 people, like what? I don't know because my audition was, was shit. 
Like I remember watching my audition tape that I that I sent to them after the fact and being like, how did they choose? Because that kid does not know what he's doing and he's an idiot. <laughs> they must have seen something. They must have seen something or I just, you know, got lucky and caught them on the right day. Um, but yeah, you know, and like I, that, cause I went to Interlochen twice. I went there the next year after that. Um, but, but that first summer I was just like chorus kid number seven standing in the back um, because I just didn't have the experience or like the ability to keep up with all these kids. Um, but in a lot of ways, looking back on it, that kind of, I think set the tone for the kind of standards that I've held to myself to since, because I kind of was there. Like I remember calling mom and dad for the first week or so being like, why am I here? I'm so out of place. I'm so bad. Like all this stuff. And I think it, it kind of instilled in me this, this, you have to work harder because you're not actually the best. You don't actually have the most talent out there, you know, which is a case in the performing arts. Like you'll never be the most talented. Right. So it all comes down to hard work. Um, right. There's so, a, there's a kind of uh, classical principle of like, uh, try and be the dumbest person in the room. And I guess in your case, like try and be the, the least talented or the least experienced person in the room and, and your yeah. learning curve is going to be the steepest. Yeah, you know, that's kind of funny because one of my best friends that summer, um, she was a girl who ended up skipping college because she got hired by the, I think the San Francisco Ballet right out of high school. Um, so she was, she was a really, really good dancer, still is a professional dancer. And I remember I'd never taken a dance class um, before going to Interlochen. And as you know, that's like uh, one of the, you know, big parts of, of doing that professionally. And right. I was talking to her one day over lunch and kind of saying like, I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm so far behind. I've got one more year of high school left. And really at that point, only four months before I was auditioning for colleges and college auditions all had dance auditions. So I was kind of freaking out and she gave me that exact same advice. She said, go back to your hometown when you're done here and even if you have to lie, lie your way into an advanced ballet class so that you are by far the worst person and, and it'll, it'll make you better faster than you ever could imagine. And I did it. I was in a class, get this. I was in a class with nothing but 13 year old girls who were kicking my ass every single day. Like I would, I, and I, I took this class. I think it was how do you four take that? How do, how do you, how does your ego accept that? You don't have an ego. You, you leave your dignity at the door <laughs> and you just, you just, Oh, it was terrible. It was so embarrassing and horrible. And like, especially for an 18 year old boy at that time, I'm like, oh, right. What's wrong with me? Crushed but by 13 year old girls. Crushed, yeah. Like absolutely crushed. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Cool. So you get to Ithaca uh, in upstate New York, and mm -hmm. uh, is it everything you hoped it was going to be? Like, is it is it the program that you wanted? Is it the you know, was it the college that you actually kind of sought when you were thinking back in Interlock and yeah, I'm going to do this professionally? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is is yes, and then some. Uh, so I, when I auditioned for colleges, the kind of I I was. I was dumb and lucky because I only, with the exception of one school, I only auditioned for like the best programs in the country. Um, programs like Ithaca, programs like Carnegie Mellon, Cincinnati, NYU, uh, that auditioned upwards of 2,000, 2,500 kids for a class size of like 20. And I, maybe it was just arrogance. I was like, ah, I'll be fine. I'll get into one of them. Uh, and I got rejected by every single one except for Ithaca. Um, so the choice at that point was either go to Ithaca or go to this other school, uh, which some of my professors from Ithaca taught at, which was, I mean, really, really a really good school. But the difference between that program and what Ithaca had was Ithaca had a, a much kind of richer history of, of alumni doing really, really well on Broadway and doing really, really well in TV and film in LA and all that kind of stuff. So they had this really, really deep network um, of people who were doing it professionally and doing it very well and at very, very high levels, which, you know, in, in all business, it's, it mostly comes down to just who, you know. Um, so 
and they just had, you know, a really rigorous program. And again, it came down to like, I want to go to a place that's just going to work me to the bone for four years. Cause I want to get out and get to New York and, and feel like I'm ready. Um, and Ithaca was exactly that. I mean, they, they, for the first two years at that program, they reserve the right to, to kick you out whenever they want. Like they have what's called a cut system where you have to like do scene work for your faculty. And then they all have a meeting about you and they, you have like different statuses and they give you a letter with all their notes and like, they were not nice. Were you ever on the border? Were you ever on the border of getting kicked yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, I was. At the end of my freshman year, they basically told me, the scene that you did last week was the best work we've ever seen you do, and we're so proud of, of your growth. But if you do that again in the first semester sophomore year, we're going to cut you immediately. And I was like, Dang. how does that make any sense? Well, you <laughs> set, the, that to my teacher you the, set the bar. Like, the hell, guys? You set yeah, the bar, but, and they expected growth. Yeah, and... um. And so it's that kind of, and their whole thing is the real world is not going to hold your hand. So why should we, um, which, you know, created some interesting scenarios where it didn't always make sense to me. Um, but they are, that program is known in New York and I, I saw it when I got here after graduating, casting directors would say like, you Ithaca kids are always so so like efficient and so self-aware and so uh just like ready for everything and i i really attribute that to the kind of um principles that that college instills in you so yeah it was it was everything that i could have hoped for and and way more i think so that was actually experience. my next question like was was there a point after ithaca where you were like cool i am actually at the level that i need to be at yeah absolutely i mean it Auditioning for, especially for theater, auditioning in New York City is, is, you know, it's, they always say like, expect to get 99 no's before you get a yes. And it, it's not that actually. It's expect to just be completely ignored until somebody says like, hey, come back here. Like, I thought that was kind of good. Um, and yeah, it like, it, I don't know, it was kind of a bit of a double edged sword because I, I did get here and I was auditioning for a solid seven or eight months with, with basically no real luck. Um, so it was a little tough, but it also, I did get a sense that I was getting closer and closer and closer and also in a way closer than a lot of my peers were. Like I just had this feeling I was getting further in callbacks. I was, you know, casting directors were sending me, were sending me emails out of the blue more than I kind of expected. So I I had a, a feeling that I was at least, on the right path. Um, even if it was really frustrating to just not get job after job after job. Right. So let's jump forward to once. Um, I have heard, and I won't name sources, our mother. (laughs) Uh, I have heard that you were very, uh, I guess proactive in doing a bit of research about the casting director and what that casting director might like in terms of, how you should approach the audition. Can you tell us about that? If by proactive you mean I was a complete stalker, then yes. Uh, (laughs) Our source was right. That's pretty much Um, what I was getting at. Yeah, I I was lucky in that I I had a couple of friends who had done uh, Broadway shows and other regional shows that had been cast by this casting director in this casting office. And when the... uh, casting notices were going out for the once tour i immediately started learning as many instruments as i possibly could because i knew that there were certain roles that i was right for in that show that would have to play 10 or 12 instruments so i started doing that and teaching myself all those things and i also was hounding my friends about jim carnahan and Stephen Copel and saying you know what's been your experience in the room with them like i you know, if i manage to get in i don't want to be surprised by anything Um, and they told me, and sorry, Jim, if, if you somehow end up listening to this, but I had heard that Jim's a little bit cold at first, not mean at all. He just, he's there for business and he's, and he's not, uh, going to go out of his, out of his way to be nice to you. His partner, Steven, on the other hand is awesome, 
right away. Like makes you feel he kind of balances. They kind of balance each other out. Like Steven makes you feel at home right away. Makes you feel like he's on your team. So yeah, I, I was like reading everything I could about them. I researched which, you know, projects they had done in the past. Um, and ultimately like it took me nine callbacks or something to book that job. But funny enough, was never surprised by anything that happened in the room. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I heard you also rearranged a few of the songs to be uh, in styles of music they like and that sort of thing. Yeah, I did. I did. I um, played, you know, because the whole audition process for that for that show is a little unique in that they they don't let anybody get to the point of reading lines for certain characters until they know that you are incredibly proficient. Uh, as a musician. So my first few callbacks, they all they asked me to do was just play songs um, on different instruments. So yeah, I rearranged a, uh, a Guster song to sound like maybe Glenn had written it. And this is where, you know, sitting and learning Falling Slowly and, and Say It To Me Now and all those things in my bedroom when I was 14 really came into play because I became, at that age, very familiar with the types of voicings and the types of chords that Glenn likes to use. Um, like there are so many of his and songs for people that don't know, oh, we're yes. talking about Glenn Hansard, Glenn uh, Hansard. Yes. The, the Irish frames singer and the guy who, yeah, the guy who wrote Swallow season. Yeah. Um, and he just has a very specific way that he always writes. And so I found a Guster song that I really liked that was in a similar key and was like, Oh, I can like totally like mess this up a little bit to make it sound more Glenn. Like I did that with a Weezer song with, uh, say it ain't so interesting. Um, yeah. And yeah. And you know, they, they said that in one of my callbacks, they're like, that was a really good choice of material. And I was like, I know <laughs> you think that was an accident, but you it think wasn't. that was an accident, please. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I did do a, a, a substantial amount of looking into the casting office and the creative team of once before I auditioned for them. Very interesting. Yeah. And once uh, was an adventure, a two-year odyssey uh, of sorts. Adventure with a capital A. Yeah, absolutely. It was insane. So um, I guess, you know, give uh, give us a bit of color here. So you leave uh, Ithaca, you finish school, you move to New York, you spend a couple of months auditioning uh, and getting nothing, and then all of a sudden you find yourself on an off-Broadway show uh, as your first show out of university, basically. Yeah, so it... it I was in New York, I think for, uh, eight months or seven months before my first once audition. And I didn't, so, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I, I didn't have an agent as an actor at that point. Um, so I, I wasn't able to get into like the, the like legitimate audition. I got my first once audition by going to like an open call that you would see on like American Idol or something. Is this where people where like line up around the block and like, you yeah, know, where it's basically just it's show a, up and decide to try to sing. Yeah. There are these, these basic like free for alls that these big shows have to do, uh, because of the, the actors union, because this once tour, it was the first, it was the, the very first tour after the Broadway show. So the once tour was going to end up being the third company to do the show on the entire planet. It was Broadway and the West end company in London. And then it was going to be us. Um, so because I wasn't part of the actors union and I didn't have an agent, I had to go to this building in Manhattan and I got there, at, I think five thirty in the morning and it was snowing and I had to like wait outside until they unlocked the building at like seven. And then I was in there and because of the nature of the show, I was in there with nothing but people with beards and flannel and boots. So like it just it was the whole process was incredibly and flannel and terrible. Boots. Yeah, it was horrible. It sounds like uh, Brooklyn, Jesus. <laughs> it basically was Brooklyn. Uh except everybody sucked at music. And it it that sounds very cynical, but it, it if you were there, you would know how torturous it was. Um so I ended up going to one of those and then you know, just luckily ended up getting callback after callback and then I got it. And, um, yeah, so that was in, in April after I think eight or nine callbacks, I got a call from the casting director saying, Hey, we'd like you to do this role. And he said something like, if you, if you're available, like, like I was possibly going to turn it down. <laughs> right. Um, right. Especially because, and I won't get too into the nitty gritty of, of it, but 
touring companies um, for Broadway shows, there's like a possible six or seven different kinds of contracts they can offer you. And the producers of this show were sending this tour out on the highest possible contract, um, which right now in the current climate is pretty rare. Um, so it's it was just one of those things that like everybody really wanted to be a part of it. And I just it was right place, right time. And I got very fortunate. Um, so we started rehearsals August of that year. So I got the call in April and had a few months to kind of sit around and learn the music. And you were in, we you didn't even have like an equity card or anything at the time, did you? No, that show was how I got my equity card. Yeah. Um, so there was all sorts of business to go through with that, but yeah, so it was, it was one of those like dream scenarios. And I, I remember saying to my friends who knew that, that casting director, when I was doing all of my research, I remember saying to them at one point, like, I'm not going to stop until I'm in this show. Like I have to be in this show because I've always loved Glenn Hansard's music and I loved the movie and it just felt like a, a perfect uh, project to work on for somebody, you know, I grew up playing music and doing theater. So it, it just felt, felt right. Amazing. Yeah. And so since the show has been done, uh, you have kind of shifted focus quite a bit, haven't you? A little bit. Yeah. So we, we left in October. October or late September of 2013 and I was with that tour the entire time that it was a union tour which was until December of 2015 so it was like two and a half years I was on tour touring the country and, and the world with that and then I got back and kind of shifted into more music based things um, it had always been kind of a, a pipe dream of mine to have a band a rock band or whatever you want to call this band. Um, and I think being surrounded by musicians of that caliber on once for such a long time kind of gave me the, the nerve, uh, to kind of strike out in, in that, in that direction and kind of start a band and start, cause I'd always written original music. I just had never really, um, pursued recording it and, and playing shows, but once kind of gave me the courage to do that. And also the network. Like I, I now knew all these musicians based in New York who were willing to jump on board with something like that. Cool. Uh, let's jump back really quickly because two and a half years on the road is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like yeah. in the sense that like you had just left university, uh, it was your first real major gig. Uh, you know, that was, I mean, that's kind of the, in one sense, that was the perfect time of your life to get hooked up into something that was going to last so long and take you so far flung from, you know, what you might have called yeah. home. Yeah, absolutely. It it really was. Was there any like standout moment where you kind of went, you know, you kind of stepped back or was it was it constant, you know, like that you kind of stepped back and went, whoa, holy shit, look where I am. Yeah, the entire first year, especially, but the entire time, but mostly the first year of, of that two and a half years uh, of that two and a half year span was that whole, like, Oh my God, what is happening? How is this even real? Like, how are they paying us money to do this right now? Because especially at that time, once was, was still the new hot ticket on Broadway. It was like this big phenomenon because so many tourists didn't know that actors could also play music and play instruments and sing and dance at the same time and play all this beautiful music. And, you know, it was the big Tony award winner of that year. It, it won, I think eight Tony awards that season. So it, it really did well. And so it was, it was the tour that all of the regional markets were really, really wanting to get. So I think our first year we, we sat at like 97 or 98% capacity at all of these theaters that we went to. So every single theater we went to was like just raucous and crazy. And just the crowds were, were so into it. So yeah, it was really, you know, it was really fun doing a show like that where you felt like the audience wanted you there and you felt like they weren't falling asleep in their chairs. Um, and the touring schedule that year was, was really special too. Cause we were in Chicago for a month, San Francisco for a month, LA for a month. Um, you know, all these really, really cool towns. Um, so yeah, it was very, uh, I don't know, a perfect situation. It was crazy. Interesting. I don't know how. I don't know how. Yeah, to yeah. It. And it was a small. I mean, the the cast itself is actually quite small for once. I mean, you guys are what, like fifteen people tops or something? Uh, yeah. Um, I think it was seventeen. Total. Okay. Okay. 
but a very small cast in terms of like what a They're normal small. Broadway show might be. Yeah, I think the the touring co- company of Lion King, if you include crew, has like a hundred people or something. Good lord! And we were traveling, I think twenty five or maybe just over that. So it was very very tight knit. So really, after a while, it just felt like you were traveling with family, right? Um, right. And playing music. And do you look back on all of that with a lot of nostalgia, or is it uh, kind of that's a period and now it's past, and you, you know it's it's not something you're going to get back in a sense? Yeah, it's a. A little bit of both. Um, I think any sort of nostalgia is is just a product of probably being unemployed in New York again and and having made the choice to transition into more of into more of this the music stuff. Um, you know, the days when when things are hard, I'm like, ah, oh, man, it'd be so nice to be like getting ready to open in Toronto again or something like that. But at the end of that tour, at the end of that two and a half year span, we had done the show 837 times, I think. Um, and we we weren't necessarily bored of it, but I think there was a, a definite sense of like, okay, we've we have spent a quarter of a decade doing this show. It's it's time, like it's time for it to be done. Um, yeah. So I, I I don't know. I don't think that I ever wake up going like, oh, man, I wish I was still doing once on tour in any sort of real way. Uh, I definitely miss it every day, but uh, I do think it was time to move on when when we closed. Excellent. Tell us about the music then. Uh, tell us about Common Jack. Where did the yeah. well, first off, where did the name come from? Well, the name. Uh, so I had always for the first year of tour. I kind of sat, I had this, you know, group of uh, collection of 10 or 15 songs that I was like, it'd be really fun to record these with a band. It'd be really fun to have a band, you know? Um, But I never wanted to be known as like a solo artist. Like, you know, I never wanted to go by my name for a couple of reasons. I, I, I think my name's a little bit boring. It doesn't have the sparkle that a lot of famous solo artists have in their name. Uh, maybe that's just their fame that gives it that, but I don't know. Uh, but also I really wanted something that would kind of serve as an entity for collaboration with other artists. Um, I didn't want it to just be about just me. Uh, so I started searching around for cool names and I went through a bunch of different, um, combinations and I, there was something about the word common that I really liked. So I was like, well, let's see if we can use that somehow. And then for some reason, I just settled on Jack because it, it kind of left me with the possibility of being a solo artist if I wanted to. Like, you'll never know how many booking emails I get where people say, hi, Jack, we'd love you to come and do this, which is kind of a nice thing that I like. You know, the, there's something cool about that mystery um, that I that I really like. Um, and so, you know, Common Jack just kind of stuck because I felt like it rolls off the tongue. It's easy to remember. Um, and it also does, in a way, I think give an idea of the kind of sound that we have, which is that kind of rootsy, uh, folk blues rock kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I got back from, from once at the beginning of this year in 2016. Oh, sorry. I should backpedal. I'm going to try to make this not as long winded as it's becoming. But while we were on tour, I figured, uh, we stopped in, in Washington DC and played the Kennedy center there for six weeks. And I figured this is a perfect time. We're here for a month and a half to like go into a studio with a bunch of my friends and record a record, uh, which we did. And we came out with our first album. Um, we, we got to work with this amazing producer who has worked with people like Madonna and Dave Grohl. And he was really awesome. A really nice introduction to a a studio setting and went in with five of my best friends and we, we recorded nine songs and, uh, released that bowl Holland. Yeah. That's our first LP. Uh, and we had a big, release party show in Boston, which was our final city on tour. So that was kind of an added, you know, icing on the cake kind of thing. And then, uh, got back to New York and I, I put together a band of some people from once, but, but mostly people that I actually just knew from here. Uh, I would have used people from once, but all of my band for the most part moved elsewhere to like Nashville and Los Angeles and stuff like that. So I was kind of putting together, uh, another, another band from scratch, but again, because of the community of once and the actor musicians in New York, it was pretty easy to do. And I found a group that, that was 
you know, fucking amazing. Um, and we kind of immediately started work on our next album because at that point I, I had written so many songs that I was like, I want to just get them recorded as, as quickly as possible. So we, you know, went into the studio again in May and uh, just this past month released that record, which is a 12 track collection called Strange New State. Nice, nice. Yeah, we've just been basically gigging in New York since then. So fun. Uh, do you have the sense that there's sort of a momentum building there, or uh, do you find that it's you know sort of like those eight months that you spent uh, in between university and and uh, once where you're you feel like you're spinning your wheels, but there's you know there's something there maybe underneath the surface. Yeah, I I it just kind of depends on which day you catch me. My answer will change, I think, but. Uh, I, I, there is an overall sense, I think that there's something happening, even if it's very minute and very small and, and almost invisible sometimes. Um, and this is just from, from looking at numbers on streaming and looking at, you know, uh, radio promotion. Uh, you know, I, I, there's been enough feedback on the new music from people that are not my friends and family you know, I, I love it when my friends and family say, oh, I really like this music. But, you know, to that extent, you, you can only trust that kind of feedback so much just because of bias. Um, but we've gotten enough feedback from people that I just do not know and have never met that I think there it's something that it at least is worth pursuing for now. Um, and we've got a lot of really exciting kind of updates and new things that are going to happen, especially at the beginning of next year, um, that we're still kind of in talks for that. I think, uh, there's stuff to look forward to for sure. Cool. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. So given that this, uh, podcast is really about adventure, um, let's talk about adventure and, uh, what could be perceived as a very adventurous lifestyle as a, you know, actor and musician that roams the world and lives in New York sometimes when it suits him. Uh, is yeah. it as adventurous as it's cut out to be? Or, you know, is it, you know, are there, are there big drawbacks that people just like to overlook most of the time? I, uh, yes and no. I mean, it, it's certainly, especially on tour, touring is its own beast and touring is, only sometimes bears a resemblance to actual what what most of us uh, call reality. <laughs> Just because uh, you know you're in a different. There was a stretch of of time on tour where we would get to a new city and you'd wake up the next morning and have to go. Okay, which time zone am I in? Like, what state am I in? Uh, and it does sound very glamorous for sure. And there's definitely aspects where you're like, oh, this is cool. Like that romantic, romanticized, like I'm out on the road, I'm unattached, like I'm doing all this cool stuff. I'm seeing all these places. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of adventure there, but it does get very exhausting traveling all that much. But also like, I think adventure is inherently exhausting in a lot of ways, <laughs> you know, uh, like you're just doing stuff all the time. Um, and, and there's not a whole lot of routine, which, you know, keeps you on your toes. Yeah, I, I would ultimately the, the short answer to that question is, yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a lot of adventure in that. Um, Do you think I mean, you hit on a point there that I think is uh, is pretty important, you know, like, do you think humans are built for? routine or do you think humans are built to inherently desire this adventure you know i think obviously from a position of routine looking out at somebody in an adventurous situation or somebody that's out unattached like you said uh you know the feeling is oh wow look at that that looks so glamorous or that looks so uh amazing but do you think, you know, what's the steady state in your mind? Do you think humans are more built for routine or do you think humans are more built for adventure? Um, I really think that that goes on a, on a case by case basis. I think, um, I know that I think that I personally am probably a little bit more built for adventure. Like I, I was one of the people who thrived on in the, on the road kind of mentality, but one of my best friends on that tour um, by the end, couldn't stand it. He was somebody who really craved some sort of routine and a home base. And I think 
Some of that had to do with the age gap. I think he is, uh, he's eight years older than I am, nine years older than I am. Um, so he was at the point in his life where he, you know, he had, he had a fiance, he had plans for where he lived in Seattle. And when I left on once I barely turned 23 and I was just basically like, we're on tour. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like people, people back in New York would ask me like, do you guys go out all the time? And I'd be like, no, no, not at all. They'd be like, well, like how often? I'd be like, oh, like six nights a week. I don't know. (laughs) Not at, like, all. Jesus, not at all. Not at all. How are you alive? And I'd be like, oh, I guess it's just if. But you know, what's funny is there's a routine in that. Like that became our routine, right? You know, so it. Uh, I think it. It just depends on the person. Um, I. But I would say definitively, definitively for myself, with where I am right now, I. Uh, I think I thrive in the adventurous lifestyle or the uprooted lifestyle. Cool. What is, uh, you know, like in the situation you're in now, uh, you know, where you've got a very, in one sense, very uncertain future, uh, you know, you're not really sure what's going to happen. You're not really sure if this, uh, groundswell, this momentum is real or not. Uh, you know, what is your greatest fear in all of that? Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, my greatest fear in, in all of what we're doing right now um damn i don't know uh i mean i guess like on a on a very surface level um especially because with with how rapidly recording technology has advanced and also with how rapidly the price on that recording technology has dropped the music industry even more so than the theater and the film industry is really oversaturated Um, so I think my immediate kind of short term, uh, worry or concern or fear is, is somehow not being able to cut through all of that noise, um, and, and reach the audience that I know this music has, uh, and, you know, at the, at the sense of, at, at the risk, uh, sorry, at the risk of, of sounding a little overconfident, I, I know that the music that we've made so far has an audience somewhere and a relatively substantial audience somewhere. Uh, but the trick I think, especially in the digital age is finding creative ways to cut through all of the other crap because it's just so overcrowded. Um, well, so, yeah, all of the other crap, but all of the other really amazing stuff that's out there as well. Well, right. Is, is well, the that's problem, the thing really, too. It's like it? the, you know, the streaming services are, are, they're great and they're terrible at the same time, but you know, for the consumer, it's amazing because you suddenly have every single artist you possibly could want at your fingertips for basically no money. Um, so it's like, yeah, it's like there, there's so many good bands. It, you know, it's I, there was a podcast I heard once where they were talking about how uh, having too many choices is actually something that makes human beings like physiologically really, really unhappy. It's called decision you fatigue. Know? Yeah. Decision, yeah. So it's like the difference between like the old days when you used to go to the grocery store and you had ranch dressing, and now you right. go and you have like chipotle mayo ranch, you know, bacon ranch. You have lime ranch, avocado ranch, like all this BS. And they're and all gonna kind of, they're all gonna give you diabetes. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's kind of where we are, where we're at with music as well. I think, um, especially because we reached a point where, in a lot of ways, it's all been done before. You know, like there's a reason why there are fewer and fewer superstars now, where it's like, if you look, if you go back to the seventies or the sixties, it was like every other week, there was some new gigantic mega superstar that's still doing crazy stuff today. And that's because there were, there were more, I think, um, frontiers to kind of pioneer. And now so much of that has been done. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing trying to like find something new and and still be authentic you know um i don't know that's like what's at the forefront of my mind <laughs> that's a hard one uh you know that yeah, i think that's tough. a really hard one like especially for for rock and roll for folk music like uh it's real hard to top those guys at the end of the 60s i mean well especially bob, bob I did mean, not leave a lot of room for improvement honestly oh no. 
jerk i mean he's yeah, like won like, a nobel prize at this stage and and <laughs> and they're not even sure he's going to show up to accept it which is i think the funniest part he didn't return their calls exactly he's which just, i think is fucking brilliant like it pretty much sums it all genius. up <laughs> yeah and you know it's like i have my own i i could fill a whole other podcast episode with my with my misgivings about this so-called folk revival of the early 2000s and 2010s i think so much of it is is bs like so much of it is I wear suspenders and I play an acoustic guitar, so I'm a folk musician. Like, no, that's not what folk music is at all. Um, like, you know, it it just, yeah, so much of it has been done in the end. Like, rock and roll and, and folk music, like, I don't know. I don't know what's left. Who do you think is on the cutting edge there? Or, I mean, and maybe not even in folk, like, who's uh, a musician who you think is actually on the cutting edge at the moment? I mean, uh, I would say in the very kind of traditional sense of folk music and, and Americana music, um, there's a singer songwriter named Alinda Lee Segarra. Uh, she is, and she fronts a band called Hooray for the Riff Raff. Um, she is a girl who grew up in the Bronx um, and at 17 or 16 or something ran away from home. And lived basically hopped trains and like not kidding hopped trains and lived on trains uh, for like two years of her life and then settled in New Orleans and started this folk band, which at first glance is a very very traditional sounding folk band, um, but they're they're people who are really upholding the the real tradition of folk music and protest music, but the the thing that I think kind of updates that band and makes it kind of a 21st century folk band is it's entirely made up of non-white gay kids for the most part. And that's like their whole thing is she's kind of at this edge of like, well, why can't, why can't I as a woman sing a love song about another woman in this Appalachian style of music, which as, as you know, like Americana and country we music grew is up. <laughs> not typically the most accepting of, of anybody who's not straight. Um, and that's not, that's not to, to kind of shit on it. Like, because I know a lot of really amazing people in that tradition who, who don't see, who are not that stereotypical. Yeah. Red yeah it's changing. It's changing slowly, um, but it is changing. Definitely changing. And, you know, Linda Lee Segarra and her band are, are kind of at the forefront of that wave, I think. And they're kind of forcing conversations like that to happen. Um, which is ultimately a, uh, what folk music has always been about. Forcing you know, conversations that need to happen. Forcing conversations about real things. It's not about singing about whiskey and your bootstraps and all that kind of crap. My pickup um, truck and my dog? No. There's awesome stuff out there that is that <laughs> that I listen to. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think uh, she is somebody who's definitely on the on the the forefront of the kind of traditional Americana um, that in that place. Cool. Let's do a couple of quick questions uh, before we finish cool. up. Uh, I don't want to use the entire evening uh, of yours. But I was going to say, suppose... you want me to keep going on diatribes? I can do that if you yeah. want. Yeah. Well, I suppose you're unemployed. <laughs> like, what do you want? Like, you got all the time in the world, right? Well, I have part time jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I make music. What? Um, I make music and I do some work. Uh, so, uh, if somebody wanted to, if somebody wanted to learn how to play an instrument, Somebody just was like, look, I've never done played an instrument. I've never gotten into music. I feel a strong pull towards it. Uh, what would be the very first thing you'd suggest they do? Um, uh, get a chord book, learn some basic chords, and then learn your favorite songs. That is the advice that you gave me when I was learning guitar, actually, when I was 13 or something. You said, just learn all of your favorite songs because that, that will uh, force you to kind of you know, pick stuff up at a, and, and also make it, uh, more fun. Cause I know for me personally, I hate sitting on a bed and like doing scales and doing like technique exercises. And while that stuff is incredibly important and, and very vital, uh, especially if you're trying to be a professional musician, I think, um, learning your favorite tunes is, is something that will never really be boring. And it will also be a very valuable learning experience. Um, especially professionally. Cause like there's also homework that is basically just listening to music and, and 
having a working knowledge of different styles and different writers and, you know, your own influences. So I, I would just say learn your, your favorite stuff. Cool. How important is, uh, like, you know, academic musical theory? Um, it's been, it's been very important for me in my personal experience. Um, just because it's, it's, it has been the, the academic musical, like my music theory classes that I took in high school and college gave me the, the language to be able to talk to any kind of musician. Um, and I was very lucky in high school and had a really, really good music theory teacher who kind of came at that subject from different angles. Um, so like, yeah, it, it was, it was very important to me, especially being somebody who like all of the arrangements for common Jack for the most part are mine. Um, they're ones that I wrote, uh, you know, especially there's a really orchestral kind of song on our first record on, on Bull Holland and all of those string arrangements I, I wrote out. And I would not have been able to do that without that music theory knowledge, you know. So very important in my experience. But cool. What uh, what one book or film? I'll give you the option: book or film has had the biggest impact on your life. I mean, once. <laughs> <laughs> not once. All right, no, no, I'm once call a it a book then. That's a cheater. Total cheater. Um, had an effect on my life. Like any sort of effect. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just give you mine, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jack Kerouac's On the Road uh, is the single reason that I, you know, spent two and a half summers in Yosemite, that I chased my now wife to Ireland, that I was yeah. completely enamored with this idea of living on the road, effectively. Totally. Uh, and kind of taking things as they came. Uh, and so that is absolutely my single greatest influence uh, in, totally. in a book. Yeah, yeah. Um, in a book, let's see. Um, I don't know if it's. It remains to be seen whether this is the the uh, book that has the biggest influence in my life. But I will say that I um, take a lot of my inspiration for how I write my lyrics and my music and all that kind of stuff um, from. Uh, a collection of Arthur Rimbaud's poetry, uh, A Season in Hell. And it's a really, really amazing, um, a really amazing collection of poetry. And he is somebody who also during his lifetime lived out on the, on the road, I guess you wouldn't call it that, but he lived for a long time in Africa and traveled around and chased, chased loves to the end of Europe and Africa and Asia and all this kind of stuff. And he, you know, he lost a leg because he got sick in the jungle somewhere and had to have it amputated. Like hate when that happens. Hate when that that sucks. <laughs> um, so I'm still, I'm, you know, I'm I'm trying to maintain uh, the use of both of my legs. But I will say that he, you know, he's somebody that, and he writes with that kind of, with the same kind of uh, quality that I think uh, Kerouac and a lot of the other the, you know, beat poets and all of them did. Um, and I actually came to. Arthur Rimbaud's work through Dylan because he's a poet that really influenced Bob Dylan. And, um, yeah, so I would say that, that is, that's one of those works in a book that I keep coming back to over and over again. So I guess by that metric, it's probably, there you the are. Most yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Well, I suppose we'll wrap it up. Uh, is there any kind of ask you have of the, uh, one or two people that'll listen to this? <laughs> Anything you want people to check uh, out? Uh, no, I mean, I don't know. I could make a shameless plug and say, listen to our stuff, Common Jack, anywhere. I think that's um, fair. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair, right? Um, but other than that, no, I, I, no ask except to get out there and live that life of adventure. Nice one. <laughs> right? Cool. Well, John, it's been great fun. Uh, yeah. And yeah, well, I suppose we don't do this often enough, so we should definitely absolutely get uh, on the phone more often. Maybe we don't have to record Jesus it every time. Christ, but I, Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Please let's. Yeah, you may even get to see your nephews every now and then, but not at quarter to midnight. So, <laughs> please. No. No, no, no. Not unless something's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? In 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 all facts, it, like it could be going horribly wrong downstairs and I would have no idea. Oh, <laughs> well, lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, listen, uh John, it's been great fun and we will uh talk again soon, I hope. Yeah. 
please. Let's right. let's make it uh, sooner than than it was last time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. All right. All well, right. Thanks. Yeah, that was fun. Um, I'll cut the recording there. I just wanted a little stop okay. gap there. Um, that was fun. That was nice. Yeah. Yeah. How'd uh, you feel? I mean, in terms of like how you're hoping that this the format of this thing runs. I have fucking like, no idea you know like uh, yeah. I think it was fun to be forced to kind of uh, work out questions on the fly and to kind of go with totally. it uh, like I interview tons of people will work but it's um, it's pretty structured because we want really similar questions to be asked the whole time and so when you're interviewing for that it's way different from like when you're actually trying to get right. bits of pieces of stories out of people right right um yeah thankfully like, you're like pretty good at that uh anyways like you kind of follow the line pretty straightforwardly like there was a couple of bits where i was like oh good good work john like this is pretty good narrative there <laughs> in my first rodeo i've been around yeah yeah i've done some radio shows <laughs> i've done some interviews before <laughs> had a few pretty embarrassing ones too I had one in uh, rochester yeah. that i did for once that was rough but, was it yeah um somebody was like can you sing for us and i was like oh shit live tv like fuck off no so I like had to find a way to tastefully avoid it without being like, get out of here. It's yeah. seven in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. I'm still drunk. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, listen, uh, I'm going to, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to try to whack it into a uh, a proper file format and export and like actually make cool. a, a podcast episode out of it. But I, I think the gist is I'm going to, uh, very slowly over a little while, try to like, uh, build up uh, four or five episodes before actually doing anything with them. Um, so we'll see, Sweet. we'll get it out there eventually, but in any case, I'll just send you the actual raw file so you can, uh, yeah. listen to the horribleness yourself if you want. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> just cringe the whole time. I'll just send it to our families. You know, mom and dad will just be like, Oh my God, look, this is amazing. Our two sons I are know. there in the microphone. Oh my I goodness. <laughs> I know. They have an aunt Carol. Be yeah, freaking out. The exactly. Whole time. Amy would be like, "What the fuck? I got left out." <laughs> Jesus. Skabapolo got on, and I didn't. Fuck. Ah, <laughs> uh, the last laugh goes to Skabapolo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nice. I knew if I played the long game, it'd be okay. Be okay. In the the very long game. Uh, very all long. right, cool. Listen, uh, I'm crushed. I gotta go to bed. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, great right. talking to you. Say hi to yeah. Jess for me, and um. So how to the yes, family and let's will. actually FaceTime with everybody when, when they're all up and around. Yes. Yes. I'm going to Chicago next week. Uh, and oh, then cool. we're going to Dublin the week after. So it probably won't be in the next two weeks, but after that, never stops. I know, I know it's pretty like it on. lately has really never stopped. For you I know, I know. But guess what? After this what? flight to Chicago, I've got platinum status with Delta. What? So what does that mean? Like, what do you get? Uh, access to their lounges and like automatic upgrades and all sorts of stuff like that. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Nice. Sweet. Uh, yeah. So once I get it, I got it for like the next the next year. Uh, I don't know if I'll travel as much next year, but we'll see. Uh, okay. Well, here's to hoping. I'll enjoy while it lasts. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. Cool, man. All right. Listen. Take care, and uh, right. I will talk to you soon. Yeah. Talk to you later. Yeah. Right. for me. Bye.